Hello, everyone. This is World Review. I'm Ivo Dalder, your host, uh, president, uh, and also the president of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. So great to have you back uh, after uh, the Thanksgiving uh, weekend. And joining us today for a important set of discussions is Stephen Erlanger, chief diplomatic correspondent in Europe for the New York Times. Steve is joining us from Brussels. Great to have you, Steve. Also joining us from London is Philip Stevens, who is the chief political commentator for the Financial Times and the director of the editorial board. Philip, wonderful to have you. And Nahal Tushi, who is the foreign affairs correspondent at Politico, joining us from Washington. Uh, thank you all for being here and glad that uh, so many people can join us online as we uh, start thinking about what the world looks like uh, post-Trump. Uh, and I guess one of the first issues, uh, Nahal, is the question of Iran. Uh, if there is one big difference between the Biden, incoming Biden administration, the outgoing Trump administration, it probably is on this issue, although there are many other. Uh, and it is right in the news because of uh, what happened on the streets just outside of Tehran when one of the chief nuclear scientists was, uh, was assassinated. And we seem to uh, have one of these emerging crises that is going to be dominating the Biden administration from day one when it enters office on January 20th. Uh, tell us a little bit about what is happening right now and how you see this developing. Uh, well, basically it kind of is coming down to the question of, um, Will the US and Iran return to the nuclear deal given all of these events that are going on in the background? And, but, but also more, how will they do it in a way that saves face, right? So yes, you have the assassination of the scientist. You have the US pulling out about half of its diplomats from its embassy in Iraq, concerns about threats, that sort of thing uh, against US officials in Iraq blamed on Iran. Uh, but the Biden administration, or sorry, the Biden team right now says it's still determined uh, to uh, go back to the nuclear deal. And the Iranians say they want to as well, but both sides essentially are saying that the other side needs to take steps first so that they can come along. And so the US says, we'll come back if Iran resumes meeting its commitments under the deal. Uh, and that's the Biden team saying that. Uh, and then the Iranians are saying, no, 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 you don't get to put preconditions on, on, on us. We will come back uh, once you lift your sanctions. And so I think what's gonna end up happening is if, if there is enough momentum, if there are not other spoilers and things like that that make it politically difficult, um, that both sides are gonna have to find a way to kind of simultaneously return to the deal and, and yet make it seem like the other side went first. Uh, Steve, what do you see uh, happening between now and the point that the Biden team becomes the Biden administration? Uh, clearly, the assassination was designed to put a monkey wrench in in what Nahal was uh, saying it, both sides want. Uh, how do you see this evolving? There's still 50 days or so before Biden uh, takes the oath of office and is in control. Well, it's I mean, as Nahal says, it's very complicated. It's not going to be easy. I mean, negotiating with Iran is never easy even when Iran is in a hurry. And President Rouhani is in a hurry, and so is Zarif, because they have elections in June, the hardliners are doing well. It's unlikely the Biden people will be in place, you know, till end of February, maybe March. So, so the real window to have something happen is just a couple months. Uh, there could be a sort of back channel but as Nahal says, there's a real issue of sequencing because Iran just says, oh, well, the US should come back into compliance, but Iran's not in compliance. Iran has built up eight to 12 times the amount of enriched uranium it's supposed to have. It's been playing difficult games with the inspectors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the Biden people, Biden himself is talking about, well, let's come back but let's also extend the sunset clauses, which Iran doesn't want to do right away. So I think it's going to be messy. The, the Europeans are just trying to keep it alive, right? Because they don't know what else to do. Um, and I just wonder, you, you know, the Supreme Leader seems to be saying to Zarif, okay, if you can get money out of this, if you can get the sanctions lifted, give it a shot. 
But already, you know, he's never trusted the United States. And certainly once Trump backtracked on a deal, which he was worried about in the first place, he's going to trust the U.S. even less. So I don't think anybody wants a war. Um, and then, of course, there's internal politics. You have the a Republican Senate, which has never liked the deal. There are a lot of Democrats who don't like the deal. There are a lot of people in Iran who, who don't like the deal. The Gulfies, the Saudis, the Egyptians hate the deal. The Israelis hate the deal. So I would say, you know, the world's not going to blow up, but, you, you know, will we get back to the JCPOA as was? Uh, we'll see. Not so easy. Philip, how does it uh, look from London in, in, in some ways, because the Europeans have been trying to keep this deal alive now that they have soon a player in Washington who uh, shares at least that ideal. Uh, is there a, a, an opening as there was back in, in, in the beginning of this for the Europeans to take a lead and try to get that negotiation between Tehran and Washington started and, and have them uh, figure out a way to get both sides to do what the Europeans want them to do, or is that uh, too much to ask for? No, I think, um, as Steve says, it's very complicated. And I think it's seen in, seen in London and I think elsewhere in Europe as a sort of, as an exercise in two stages. The first is to get that, as we've heard, that simultaneous, if you like, lifting of the American, um, or the return of the US and the return of Iran to full compliance with the UN. And that's, as Steve said, it's gonna be very tricky. And we may say, see Israel and others um, come to try to disrupt it uh, more. And then there's the second stage, which is, okay, we're not just gonna keep the agreement as it is, we need to extend it. And Europeans are talking about extending it beyond, or the US has talked about extending it beyond nuclear weapons to, you know, uh, very sophisticated rocketry, etc. I think the Europeans are doing a fair amount of diplomacy themselves in the region and are being as supportive of Biden as they can. This is very important, I think, sim emblematically for Europe, but also for transatlantic relationship because of the, of the effect of US sanctions on European countries and businesses. So I think a lot of effort is being put in this. One European diplomat said to me the other day, and this is just this was just a throwaway remark, so this isn't necessarily news, that he'd be surprised if William Burns, who was um, instrumental in the Obama administration's negotiation, was now in the Gulf at some point before perhaps the, uh, the, pre the, the president-elect takes office. But that was a throwaway remark. But there's, you know, some maybe some work's going on behind the scenes. Well, clearly, uh, Nahal, a lot of things, a lot of things moving here uh, uh, in order to see even if we can get this deal back together. I, sh I should note that the new National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, was uh, the one who accompanied Bill Burns uh, on that very original trip back to Oman in 2012. Uh, so uh, also someone intimately familiar with uh, negotiating with the Iranians and trying to open up uh, the prospect of, of a deal. Uh, but I think as, as Philip uh, uh, said at the end, and, and Tom Friedman wrote a, a piece about this in the, uh, in the New York Times uh, just the other day, this missile issue and particularly the precision guided missile uh, question that is now uh, clearly something that the Saudis and the UAE and the Israelis are, are terribly concerned about for good reason. Uh, given uh, what these Iranian missiles can do, may well uh, enter as a new factor in, 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 in this negotiation. What's the scuttlebutt in, in Washington, uh, Nahal, that you hear about how do you get that part of the uh, equation uh, settled as well? I think there's still a lot of unknowns on that. I mean, yes, Biden and his team say, we want to uh, talk about other things. We want to have like a follow on agreement. Uh, and possibly include missiles, but I don't get any sense that the Iranians are willing to go there. Uh, now, my understanding about this this idea, though, of like a of another more extended agreement that a follow on agreement is that what the Biden people are privately telling the Iranians is, look, you need to either not say anything about that, or say you're open to the idea, or say you agree to the idea of having follow-on negotiations, but don't reject it publicly. 
And so that could be the key difference is if the Iranians just don't publicly reject the idea of a follow on negotiation, we could end up returning to the Iran deal on both sides as it was. Now, whether it'll survive that long, collapse over time, I don't know. But then, you know, then the question becomes once both sides are back in, can they actually launch these um, follow on negotiations that could cover things like missiles and, and other things? And also worth noting, though, that, you know, uh, the two things. One is that there's a lot of questions about how long Biden's going to be in power. A lot of people expect him to just stay, you know, for one term. And so for the Iranians, the question of whether there's going to be another pendulum swing if a, if the, if a Republican comes back um, is, is really an open question. And then the other thing I would say is you have Gulf Arab states like the Emirates and others saying they want a seat at the table on these negotiations in the future. And I just don't see the Iranians going for that. Well, and then, Steve, uh, of course, the, uh, I mean, jump in, but, but also uh, uh, think, talk a little bit about there are two other parties to this, to this agreement that no one ever talks about, the Russians and the Chinese. Uh, uh, and, and, and sort of, you know, they're, they're assumed they'll do whatever we will, uh, we will tell them to do or we and the Europeans tell them to do. How likely is that? Well, it's a, it's a very good question because the Chinese who never liked to publicly veto anything, or at least didn't used to, now they're getting more aggressive. Um, but the Chinese have been breaking the oil embargo right along. I mean, they're the ones pretty much keeping the Iranians going. Um, and so we've shut our, you know, the United States and, and the rest of the signatories have pretty much shut their eyes to that. Russia has real concerns about Iran, particularly about missiles. I mean, it is next door after all. It doesn't want a nuclear Iran, which is why Russia's played such a, you know, helpful game. I mean, the Russians have been very, very helpful throughout all of this process, by the way. Um, but what worries me is, you know, if in June in Iran, you get a much harder line government, then it's, un it's going to be very hard to follow on negotiations anyway. Though certainly the Europeans have been wanting to do that. I mean, they were trying with Pompeo and Brian Hook for quite a long time to keep the deal alive, to open it up to a bit of regional and missile discussions. But when Trump pulled out of it altogether, he just got fed up. I think it was in May of 2018 that was the end of that. But I mean, there's still this desire, even among conservatives, to get Iran back into some kind of talks. Now, my sense is, now I'm not in Iran, but my sense from the Iranians is missiles are off the table. It's too important to them. It's too important to Hezbollah, to their other allies, call them allies, proxies, whatever. Um, but we'll see, I mean, Iran is in trouble it's economically in trouble, it needs money. And some people are suggesting even a temporary, you know, thing where they cut a lot of their enriched uranium, if not altogether, in return for a big chunk of cash that the Americans have taken from seized oil, right? I mean, there are all kinds of intermediate things that could be done fairly quietly without congressional approval that could get things back on track. You know, no, I just feel that, you, you know, when people blithely say we'll come back to the JCPOA, I, I don't think that's really very easy. And I don't think it's gonna be enough. And the Iranians are gonna want something more that they can count on like legislation. So that the same thing that happened with Trump doesn't happen again after a Biden presidency. Well, it seems to me, Philip, that, that this may be a, a generic uh, issue. It, it turns out it may be a lot easier to walk away from agreements and organizations than walking back into them. Uh, and, and, and sort of the question of, of even if you have an administration that is truly committed to doing so, uh, what it does to the general order when you have a US that goes back and forth, then as is all said, uh, how long how are you going to bank on, on, on four, eight, 12 years of democratic rule or just four years? Uh, and and how, so how, does, how do you see that? Well, I mean, this is the sort of, I suppose, the big question for all of um, America's allies at the moment. I mean, there's, if you like, in Europe, there's huge celebration, except in places like Hungary or Poland, but at uh, Mr. Biden's election and talk of a new grand bargain, 
embracing you know a whole raft of things from promoting from Iran to promoting democracy to doing things on climate change technology together when you get past that the sort of euphoria you get the yeah but one how much is he going to be allowed to do in his own term and two how much does he represent a does his election represent a, a sort of a long-term swing back to internationalism from the US or how long before we get someone, it won't be Trump, but someone else who wants to pull back. But I think at the moment, the, I mean, I think Iran is very, very important for Europeans. It sort of has a, I think an emblematic importance, partly because of sanctions and partly because it was something that Europeans started in the first place. But I think generally the view is that we need to be really positive for the next two years going into the US midterms and for Europe and the US to show that they can do things. And we'll have to take it on trust. We don't have any, you know, there's no guarantee for anybody in this. But I think for now, Europeans are willing to take on trust that this is a, a permanent shift in American policy. So, Steve, this is also playing out in, in, in that other issue, uh, or just playing out in many issues, but the issue of, of European defense cooperation and indeed of, uh, uh, of NATO, which you've been writing about in the past few weeks uh, in, in some detail. This debate, uh, on the one hand, Biden's coming back. He's probably the most Atlanticist president, at least since George H.W. Bush, uh, perhaps even more so than him. He has a a, a, a secretary of state nominee who is more Atlanticist than many, if not most of his predecessors. So there's this hope of, and, and a real commitment uh, to come back to NATO. Indeed, a commitment by, uh, backed by the Hill uh, just, in, uh, just today uh, or the other day when uh, the decision to withdraw troops from Germany was reversed by Congress, uh, uh, in, in, uh, at least for the time being. Uh, so there is this hope that NATO is coming back. But in the meantime, a big debate going on in Europe about uh, how uh, that should play out both within NATO and within, within Europe. Yes, it is really fascinating because, as Philip said, with Biden, they got what they wanted. But then it's presented them all kinds of problems. Um, and in a way, it's made some fissures clearer than, than they were before because it's very easy for Europeans to sneer at Trump and dislike Trump and Trump didn't like them and Trump had contempt and he kept ha kept haranguing them and telling them they were free riders and 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 wimps and couldn't defend themselves and so on um, and in response Europe began to talk a lot more seriously about what it would be like to take more authority to speak the language of power, as they say, and actually do something about it, to spend more on defense, which Trump and many other presidents have also wanted them to do, but to do it as part of NATO, but as, as something that has, could somehow act more on their own, particularly in their neighborhood, in North Africa, in the Eastern Mediterranean. And the French have been pushing this, which is very French, it's very Gaullist, uh, the Germans are much more nervous about it just because NATO is in the DNA of post-war Germany. I mean, being embedded in alliances in the EU, in NATO, is like part of the basic law. The French don't, don't see their security in quite the same way. They, they already have strategic autonomy. They have a nuclear force. And now that Britain is out of out of, out, out of the European Union, France is the preeminent military power. It also has an, a military industry that it wants to help. There's nothing like European money to help that along. So for all these reasons, um, they're having this kind of basically rhetorical debate about you know, what it should be and what it should be called and how independent it should be. The fact of the matter is right now it feels a bit silly um, because uh, even the Germans understand they need to do more and spend more. Uh, the Europeans have responded with this uh, program called PESCO, which is designed to improve European defense research and spending. And they have now under pressure from the Americans and the Canadians and so on. And as a gesture to Biden, they've opened it up to third countries to participate. Um, but 
underneath this silliness, everyone keeps saying, oh, it's a silly debate. There actually are real issues and real divisions. Um, and the Germans also understand that Central Europe and Eastern Europe doesn't trust the French, not for their own security. They want to keep the Americans in involved. With Biden, it should be easier. I mean, as you say, Biden is a great transatlantic. He's a very romantic transatlanticist, right? There aren't many left. Um, and, and everybody wants to have good relations with Biden. So it'll sound good, but underneath it is, is this big debate on the part of, of the Europeans about how autonomous they can be, should be, want to be, um, as long as it doesn't damage relations with, with the United States, but also doesn't make them pawns of American policy. Um, and, and that's an old debate, but it's, it's actually almost more acute with Biden's election. It's interesting uh, that you get this debate that goes back to the 1960s in some way, uh, uh, back in Europe. And, and Philip, the, the voice that seems to be missing, and maybe it's because uh, I'm, I'm reading and, and watching it from Chicago, is the voice that used to be pretty central to this debate was the UK. Uh, yeah, well, the UK is missing. I mean, just to your point, this debate about European defense and NATO went, goes back to the Cold War, and the, when they were seen as European and NATO seem in comp seen in competition uh, with each other, not least by the United States. And the issue that has to be resolved, now the one I think underlies Steve's points, is, is that you've got to find a way that you can have a serious European defense capability that deals with Africa south of the Sahara, deals with more problems in the Middle East, while making sure, as the Germans would say, the US remains on the side in Europe and persuading the French that there is some autonomy. I don't think it should be beyond the wit of, you know, strategists on both sides of the Atlantic to, to do that. On the UK, we're absent. I mean, the, the ha we're supposed to be having this great strategic foreign policy, defense, diplomatic review. Um, it keeps getting pushed back. Uh, Boris Johnson has announced quite a big in increase in the defense budget. Um, for the next four years. Um, that's widely seen here as a, if you like, as a, as a way to, to try and buy a bit of um, credit with the incoming Biden administration, because they're quite fearful that we will, one, because of Mr. Johnson's friendship with Donald Trump, but two, because we're outside the EU now, there's a, quite a lot of fear that we're going to be on the edge of influence in Washington. So he's done that. But he's also cut at the same time the development aid budget, which takes us out of lots of important stabilization uh, projects. So we are obsessed with Brexit. Um, I think we're going to be remain obsessed with Brexit, even if there is a deal, because it's a very it'll be a very thin deal, trade deal that's done. So um, we are not thinking. Uh, the prime minister keeps talking about global Britain. But the, th the fact is that we're thinking very peripherally at the moment and boasting that we're first with the vaccine. I mean, how silly. Yeah, that's a, that, that was quite, a, a, quite an interesting uh, development, uh, particularly since it was not, it was a, a vaccine developed in Germany and in the United States, but uh, never, never mind. Uh, 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 and made in Brussels. It's not even made. Exactly. Uh, in right. Britain. <laughs> uh, too. Uh, Sorry. No, no, it's a, uh, you know, this is, this is, this is all part of it, right? Uh, uh, now, uh, uh, you know, this is, as, as Philip mentioned, this is a debate that also takes place in the United States. It, it's in rarefied circles uh, uh, of Atlanticists and Europeanists and, and those who worried about a Europe that can drag the United States into war as happened in 1914 and in, in, in 1940. Uh, and that kind of rhetoric which was there, particularly during the Cold War and, and its immediate aftermath. Do you have a sense of where the Biden administration is on this? Do they, do they care wh uh, which way Europe goes, whether it's more NATO or more EU? Um, I, you know, I don't think that they're necessarily like thinking those things have to be opposed to each other. Uh, I mean, obviously I think their top priority is keeping NATO um, strong and, and 
you know, the alliance with, with the Europeans overall just strong and re returning to it in a sense. But I, the thing about the Biden administration, I think it's going to be interesting to watch in terms of all this, like, you know, transatlanticist funding and NATO and all this stuff is, is where progressives come down on it. Because look, Biden is under a lot of pressure from the left, left flank of his party to cut defense spending. And so if there's any like sense that, you know, he can take advantage of a situation where, you know, he also like other presidents before him, including Trump, uh, pushes NATO and others to be more independent, uh, to do more of their own sharing of the burden or whatever. I think he's gonna get a lot of plaudits from the left. And I think he's gonna get a lot of pressure from them to just basically cut what the US is doing overall. Um, they, one demand from progressives is that he should cut the defense budget by $200 billion. And that's like not going to happen. But you know, the fact that they're willing to put that out there and they're willing to like pressure him uh, is, is pretty interesting. And so far, frankly, he has not done a lot to make progressives happy, uh, even with his nominations and so forth. And so I think there's going to be pent up frustration and pressure on the left. Uh, you know, to push Biden on a number of these fronts, uh, and if if he doesn't do other things to appease them, a, a good reminder that domestic politics in the United States also continues as we go, and it's not just Dems against uh, D's against R's; it's within each of the parties too. Steve, well, I was just going to add one thing. I mean, um, partly because of these French complaints a year ago, when Macron said NATO was traveling toward brain death. He was angry about Syria. He was angry about Trump behaving, um, you know, on his own unilaterally. But because of that, they had a reflection group. Um, the, the Secretary General named a reflection group um, with a former American Assistant Secretary for Europe, Wes Mitchell, as one of the co-chairmen and a German co-chairman. Ten people, of course, perfectly split. Five men, five women from all over NATO. And they've come up with a report that's quite in interesting, it seems to me, as a basis for a new NATO strategy, because the old one is now 10 years old and it was before Crimea, when they still thought Russia was gonna be a partner and it didn't even mention China. So this one deals much more with uh, the, the challenge to NATO of Russia and China, but also in ideological terms. Um, they see a more political NATO. They're trying to draft the idea of a NATO where uh, like-minded Western democracies and at least semi-democracies, because NATO is a big broad church, can come together to talk about how not to get absorbed by China and how to keep deterring Russia. And, and I think this is interesting. I mean, this report's out there, it's not that long, it's full of too many recommendations, but it does kind of point the way toward a new bargain, which the Americans want, which I think Biden people want, to get the Europeans and others to talk about what is this new China that Xi Jinping is so open about and what do we do about it? Well, let's let, let's shift to that China, and I want to come back to the democracy issue in in, in a second. Uh, 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 Philip, you you your, your column today in, in the FT uh, focused on on the, the real need for Europe to uh, to finally make a, a fundamental decision that when it comes to issues of values and others, siding with the United States against China is job one, and what is happening with the Chinese in their own neighborhood, and importantly, what they are. Uh, uh, have been doing in the last few weeks with regard to Australia sort of shows the problem uh, that uh, uh, countries, the smaller middle powers have uh, when it comes to China and the real choice that is, uh, that is before us. Yeah, um, I think that choice is sharpening. And if you to go back again to a Cold War analogy, there was a time during the 1950s when a lot of European countries, including the UK, Thought, saw themselves as mediators between the United States and the Soviet Union. Churchill and Macmillan were always trying to sort of see whether they could, you know, mediate a deal. Uh, and then we took sides, you know, I mean, you can date it to Cuba or you can date it to Berlin in the early 60s before, but you have to take sides. I think Europe is 
it's gone through in, in with China in a much more sort of concertina way from two or three or four years ago, thinking of China simply as an economic opportunity and we'll leave the geopolitics to the US. More recently, it's begun to realize that China's is a challenge to democracy, to the global order, to everything that Europe stands for in terms of rules-based orders. So there's been the designation of China last year in the national security strategy of the EU as a strategic competitor. But the point I was trying to make, and I think is important, there's still this residual, but you know, couldn't we just sort of mediate rather than commit ourselves? And I think this was understandable with Trump because you didn't want to line up between behind the US administration and you didn't know what that administration was going to do. It's entirely unpredictable um, and dangerous in a way. But I think now with the new administration, which is going to take a hard headed, but if you like, reasonable and intellectually grounded view of China, Europe is going to have to get off the fence. And, you know, you can't talk about, look, let's all the democracies get together in this new, you know, to, to sort of reverse the tide of authoritarianism and then say, but with China, look, you know, maybe we'll just, you know, we'll sort of sit in the middle of this. That's a real challenge, uh, Nahal, uh, that presumably in the United States, uh, uh, even under the Biden administration, the push is going to be for you to come, you, the allies, to come to our, to our side. I, I note today in the Wall Street Journal, John Ratcliffe has a, an op-ed uh, as the, uh, the head of the, the, uh, the intelligence, the director of national intelligence, in which he calls uh, China and the Chinese Communist Party the biggest threat the United States faces since World War II, which is quite a statement. Uh, when you when you come, but if that becomes the U.S. view, and Adam Schiff is quoted uh, saying, "Yeah, that's you know, there's there's agreement on this on both sides of the aisle." If this is the U.S. view, uh, how is the Biden administration going to succeed? Where in some ways uh, the Trump administration has not in in gathering a grand coalition. How are they going to go about it? Uh, well, I have really struggled with this question, like especially whenever I deal with the Biden folks, because. I'm like right now I'm trying to write a China story and I, I need to pin them down on exactly what they're going to do. And it's just totally impossible because what you basically get is, well, we're going to be tough, but we're going to be smarter. And it's just, it's like, we're going to be their competitor, but we're going to also work with them on things like climate change and, and so forth. And I, Look, I, I just don't know exactly how they're going to manage to balance all this. I, I do know one thing they definitely want to do is kind of like we were talking about, get more of an alliance situation going. If they can get uh, a bunch of countries on board, if they can show China that, you know, we are all united and we do make up a huge part of the world economy that, you know, they need to, to sell products to, um, that can have a lot of leverage. But uh, trying to separate the economics from the politics, from um, even you know some of the weird diplomacy that the Chinese are doing now, uh, it's going to be a very fine um, needle to try to thread. Because I, I just I think they're going to I think the challenge is going to be they're going to have a, a nuanced approach, and politically that is also going to leave them open to a lot of criticism. So we've already had like senators like Marco Rubio and others who, in theory would be, these are moderate, well, I mean, they're Republicans who in theory would be willing to work with the Biden administration on a number of China issues. But Rubio has already been tweeting out and, and writing columns, basically calling the Biden team weak on China already. And so the question is, how are they going to like deal with the politics, which are not always going to be friendly, but also manage to actually accomplish things in a bipartisan fashion and in an international fashion that will put the Chinese uh, on notice, and I think it's just going to be very, very tricky, and it's going to be a lot of a uh, lot of challenging stories to try to write in, in the coming months. Steve, I, I used to tell my friends in Europe that when they asked for the United States to, to be a little bit more diplomatic and subtle, I said the U.S. doesn't do nuance well. Uh, <laughs> oh, and, and no. trying, yeah. uh, it's Sorry, really, really coming to the fore, and, and yet you know you don't play this game. Uh, if you want to call it a game, it's a deadly serious one of competing uh, with a, a rising power 
uh, um, uh, with just full force and, and, and no thought. Um, uh, that, that yeah. Is, yeah. This, is, this is kind of exactly like, so I'll give you an example of the, the confusion that I think is gonna arise. Just the other day, Jake Sullivan, who is the, the designated national security advisor for Biden, puts out a tweet talking about how important the, the US views its relationship with Australia, right? Now, Australia is right now in a major diplomatic tiff with China. Now, Jake puts out this tweet. It's, he hasn't tweeted a lot, so people notice it. But the tweet doesn't mention the word China. It's, he's basically subtweeting China, you know? And, and, and I'm like, okay, is this how it's gonna be? Like, we're gonna like go after China, but not actually mention them? So this is the type of thing where I feel like it, it's like a very, very, very vague type of situation and trying to get the, our hands around it's gonna be really tough, challenging. I I'm also going to be very interested to see who are the China people in the end that Biden picks, because that will have a, that that I think will tell us quite a lot. Maybe, maybe Jake's next tweet will be just buy Australian wine. <laughs> but I mean, it's I agree with Nahal. I mean, we are trying to manage a relationship with a country that churns out that's still building coal fired plants that's churning out a huge amount of carbon, which knows it's creating problems for itself with climate and so on, wants to do better. But also, you know, you just have to listen to Xi Jinping. This is a country that wants to run things in the next 30 years. And by, by 2050, it wants to be at least as powerful as the United States, if not more so. And it wants Taiwan back. So, I mean, one of these big questions I, I think they're gonna face quite quickly is what do they do about Taiwan? What do they do to increase deterrence on Taiwan? There'll be all kinds of trade questions, WTO reform, be nice to get China to help with that, right? Be nice to get Europe to help with that. Um, on, on issues of health, the WHO, viruses, we need China, we need China. Um, but you're right, sometimes we do diplomacy the way the Russians do warfare. There's not much subtlety there, right? Um, and, and at the same time, I do think we should take what the Chinese are saying pretty seriously. And the tone of their diplomacy, certainly, which is approved by the Central Committee and the top, is very aggressive. Um, and, and it it is very difficult with countries that challenge it like Australia. I mean, it seeks to punish. So the, so the question is, you know, can we get together in a way that at least um, looks at Chinese technology, for instance, in a joint way that creates Western champions for 5G, for instance, right? Um, that, that actually screens Chinese investment in a joint way that protects values um, and that it doesn't shut up about the Uyghurs and Hong Kong and, and, and repression, though understanding that the Chinese are gonna do whatever they want, that's the problem. No, it's, it's very delicate. Nahal's quite right. I think it's too early to know what their policy is gonna be. And we're still, as she said, really at the level of soapbox or slogans and that's not going to be good enough pretty soon we did we did just coming very quickly we did navigate some of this during the cold war it wasn't as complicated because we didn't trade with the soviet union but we did navigate a relationship which allowed you know wars to be going on in central america and africa while we were we were striking strategic arms deals and whatever so it is possible. What I'd say about China's aggressive diplomacy, as Steve puts it, is as far as Europe's concerned, that's good in the sense that it makes Europe cohere around a tougher policy. I mean, it's been doing on, on, a, on a less severe scale the same to uh, Sweden as it's been doing to Australia, trying to single out. And I think, you know, I think China is, in a sense, his own worst enemy here in making it easy, easier for democracies to gather together. And the EU, of course, put out a statement 
as well, saying how um, w that it stands in support of Australian democracy. Not a big thing you may say, but it's a move in the right direction. So immensely difficult, yes. Um, impossible, I wouldn't say so. Apparently the Chinese don't do uh, diplomacy uh, with nuance either. So that makes it in that sense a little easier. Uh, Philip, staying, staying with you uh, uh, in just as, a, as the last issue uh, for us to address, which is, which is um, just follows very logically on this, uh, uh, Biden has, if there is one defining element during the campaign on foreign policy, was working with uh, democracies and putting democracy and human rights back up front in, in American foreign policy. He's called for a, a summit for democracies uh, to be put together. And one, would, one, one could see this as part of an, a, a possible response to China. Uh, but the difficulty with this uh, is, and Nahal wrote about this and others have too, uh, not all of our friends uh, and partners are very democratic and the EU is struggling with this in, in, in Europe. Uh, and how do you, you know, how do you overcome this particular issue? Something you have written about and care about. I think you can't solve it, but I don't think we should underestimate how important uh, Mr. Biden's election was. It was impossible for Democrats around the world to go out and make the case for democratic governance while the world's largest, most powerful, the world's most powerful democracy had a president who clearly didn't believe in democracy. The fact that the, you know, the United States now has a president utterly committed to democracy is transformational. It gives you, it puts you back in the game. It's not sufficient, but it, it, it changes things. We're never gonna have, you know, perfect democracies across Europe and the European Union's having this big fight now with Hungary and Poland about uh, their unwillingness to, to step up to, to, the, to, to the accepted standards on the rule of law and uh, justice systems. Those fights are gonna go on. But I think that as long as the, the chat and the, the proclamations about democracy are accompanied by solid cooperation. And I'd say on top, someone like China, the most important thing transatlantically in the next year or so will be whether the US and Europe can get together on things like standard setting in technology, can get some basic trade deal done, not, not, not TTIP, but some basic trade arrangement done. Um, and we're beginning to see the beginnings of, uh, we're beginning to see that happening. The, we had a good story, I think this week, about Huawei and the European Commission, where the European Commission is beginning to coordinate government's policies. Now, this is gonna be messy. I don't think it's all gonna be in one direction. And I'm not, you know, I, no one can be sure of the outcome, but at least I'd say democracy is now on the right foot. You know, there is now an opportunity, whereas before we were all stuck and defensive against the sort of, the, 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 the advance of autocracy. Uh, Mahal, it does help if the, uh, the the leader of the largest democracy is also committed to that. Uh, I think that's uh, that certainly helps in, in this process. But as you have written, the, the, the issue of how do you bring a summit of uh, of uh, for democracy, I think they're calling it, how, who do you invite to such a meeting uh, has been uh, a, a problem that we've had before with the community democracies. Uh, what do you what do you hear uh, when you talk to folks uh, in Washington about this? Oh, it's it's really fun conversations. I mean, there are people who say you shouldn't invite India. They don't think, they think India is backsliding. Uh, there's others who say, well, um, you know, Turkey is absolutely out of the question. My favorite though is uh, Imran Khan, the prime minister of Pakistan, who in his congratulations tweet to Biden said, I'm looking forward to the democracy summit. So he's just assuming that he's gonna get an invitation. Uh, it's, it's really, really gonna be interesting. I think whoever though came up with the idea of calling it the summit for democracy was smart because I think it probably dawned on them that we need to label it this so that you, know, you might wanna bring in some folks who, who at least say that they support democracy, even if they don't really exhibit it. Uh, but then, you know, that, that makes me laugh because, you know, 
I mean, what is, what is North Korea's actual name? The Democratic People's Republic of Korea, right? So what does it really mean? Um, I look forward to uh, figuring out how they, uh, how they solve this one in the, in the coming months. Steve, and, final. Well, it also probably doesn't help that the current president of, of the United States is going to leave office without ever acknowledging that he actually lost a fair election. As I keep saying, he, he said the election he won in 2016 was rigged. He's convinced the one he's lost is rigged. And unfortunately, a lot of people in America believe it to be rigged. And, and, and I, I, I worry what this will do in the long run, not just to our own democracy, but to our reputation as, as the torchbearer for big popular democracy in the world. It still leaves a lot of whataboutism to be had on the part of not very democratic states. Sobering question to end uh, a really great discussion on uh, Steve Erlanger, Philip Stevens, Nahal Tushi. So thank you so much for joining us and for all of you online uh, watching now or later, thank you for joining us. This was World Review. We'll be back next week with another version and another edition uh, of World Review with the news of that week. Thank you all for joining us and have a great weekend.